Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome in our second training Tuesday. Um, I'm very, uh, I'm Job Delamar. I'm an international master and I'm giving chess lessons uh, as a profession. And I want to share with you some interesting thoughts about um, how we can improve on our games and how important it is to find model games uh, and to uh, try to understand what we can learn from it. And of course, try to use it and apply it in your own games. Um, this idea was actually brought up um, in last, past, last week where one of my pupils was playing one of the games and um, it was a new pupil. So I was just very surprised how, yeah, what he could do. And actually he made almost a copy of one of the famous games of Capablanca who played Janowski. In, and um, what's interesting in this game is that uh, he, he played almost all the moves which uh, Capablanca played. Of course, there were some small improvements. But this is actually the way in which I notice also grandmasters are playing. They have a very uh, clear concept of a good game. Uh, and after they try to apply it, of course, in their own games. So let us watch it, um, how this uh, game continued. And after I will show you another game which worked in a different way. Um, this game, he played it. And after I will show him, or I showed him, uh, how the grandmaster played. So uh, we, so one game I will show you that he, uh, he actually played already the modern game and he didn't even know it. And after I played a game myself, which I studied by one of the games of Karpov and there uh, I took all his ideas and tried to apply them and I will show you how you can do it in a different way. And the good thing about everything is that this is one of the things uh, we can learn from chess. Of course, if you're interested and you wish to have these model games too, or you want help to it, you can always contact me and I can try to see if I can help you in a training session or whatever. So feel free to ask questions and I will try to get back to them as good as possible. So in this game, um, my people played uh, several moves and I will just show you um, um, how it went. And sometimes I will have a short um, time break where I will give you some time to think. This was one of the great feedback which I got from you from the last show. So we always listening to your commands and everything and tips. So please always feel free to, uh, yeah, to help us to improve the product and of course the live shows. So you play B5. B5 is actually an excellent move. Why is it important? Because we, um, we the opponent C3 is uh, weak. So we want to uh, keep it at its place. And already we see that the bishop is protecting b5, so this pawn won't be that vulnerable at the moment, uh, especially also because the rook on a8 is attacking a2. Um, and so white continued with bishop b2, um, knight to a6. As we can see, of course, sometimes the moves aren't the best, but it's more, again, to try to understand how um, how we uh, can improve our play and how we can use or apply model games. So you play knight a6, very clear concept. He was protecting the pawn on b5, um, which is actually his main weakness and after he's also controlling d5, so it gives him secure center control. Um, after this, uh, rook went to b1. Nice open file. And here comes the interesting moment, which I want to give you a brief thought. Um, I will pause for some uh, seconds and how you wish black to continue. We have, yeah, we have a choice between king e7 and castling, more or less to uh, bring the last rook in the game. So give it some thought. Try to think what you would prefer to do and um, yeah, what looks best to you. So also a good thing is that when you watch the show back, uh, there's an interesting moment at this moment. You can pause a little bit, you can think even longer and after you can of course start the position again to see what the solution was. 
In actually in the game, Black played Castle, which of course is in general a good move. Um, in this way, he connects his rooks, uh, bring his king into safety. But we should remember that in the end game, um, the king belongs usually to the more to the center. It can become a very active and strong piece. So actually, we should have played, or he should have played King E7. King E7 is a good improvement. He can bring the king to the center and the rooks still are connected and you can bring them on the A file. Some small improvement, of course, in this position it might be a little bit more dangerous because uh, there's an opportunity to play C4, which of course uh, gives a pawn, but uh, white might have some interesting conversation to, to the king, which is already getting to the back rank. Although in this position it's also clear that it's very hard for white to uh, yeah, win back the pawn on, uh, on, on the queen side. Um, he might play a4, but still it's not completely clear how he will get compensation. So um, after king a7, uh, of course there's an opportunity maybe to play a4, which of course is another way to bring in the rook in the game and probably this was a white's best move with maybe even small advantage. But as I said, the main thing which we should remember today is that how we can learn from modern games. Not every detail in this, in this position is uh, important. So we will get back. Castling is of course an, another good move and again white should have played a4 which is clearly the strongest. Um, but white played king f1, h6, little waiting move and maybe there are some ideas with g5, uh, king e1. And now comes interesting uh, position because black can pl either play on the king side or queen side. On the king side, of course, there was a very tempting move g5, uh, attacking the knight and chase it away. Um, but he can attack it. And now we see that we are missing actually one move. We would like to play king to g6 and in this way try to improve, um, uh, yeah, improve the the position and secure g5, so the knight would be out of the game. Um, that's uh, that's one um, one thing. Um, of course, we can play g4, uh, but after knight f4, um, it's uh, black can play king g7. Maybe with some idea of rook h8. Black is still better, but it's not sure if it if if this is really giving much already. So. Often what we will see in games is when you have an opportunity but it doesn't bring immediately big something big, we prefer to prepare it. And we have even in the Berlin Wall, we have even ideas like something like King H7 with the idea of going for G5 the next move and after we have opportunity to play King G6. Although white should play H5 in such position just to prevent such action. Um, we go back. King e1 and he played rook a7. Very nice move, especially for his young age. He's doubling the rooks, improving his position, and from there he's uh, yeah, he's improving actually and bringing the last rook into the game. Uh, white king became active, so as we, I already mentioned before in the end game, we see that uh, we often try to activate our pieces, but immediately we could see that if we go a little back um, to this move. You already could think, hey, if the king goes to c2 in any way, why he didn't play king d1? And this is some kind of improvement which are very important. When you are um, when you're working on your chess, very often you analyze games, and after several moves, you try to understand what you wish to do, and then of course you go back and see much more easier which improvement you could have made. Of course, it's all in backside always easier than when you're while you're playing the game but that's why we, it's so important to analyze the game after the um, yeah after you play them so um, in this position he played uh, I will promote the move rook a7 he played king d1 um, here uh, the, the rook went to a8 again activating and rook b2 now comes an interesting moment where I will give you a little spare time again um, uh, to think um, how black can improve his position again. We, we activated already both rooks, so now you have a little time to think how we can improve our 
position further. So which of the pieces can be improved now and to which to which place? I hope you already gave it a little thought. And well, we have several pieces which we prefer to improve. Maybe the knight on c7, you can think he's only defending. But on the other hand, what the knight can be doing better. I mean, the knight is defending b5. It's very difficult to protect it in another way. So the knight is fine at the moment. And like in football, we also need a goalkeeper and the knight is doing his task. The bishop on d7 is interesting. I notice very often that my pupils wish to put it on c6, which um, in some way feels very safe. I mean, I, I, um, I learned that the bishop often uh, um, was, uh, was called like a spider in a web uh, with all those pawns around him. Uh, which looks aesthetic, very uh, aesthetic, uh, very nice. But on the other end, the bishop just became more passive. The bishop was doing much better work on d7, was controlling g4. So why would we like to play stone c6 beside it's more beautiful? It's not a beauty contest. So what we can see in general, um, to have some overview of what's going on, is that uh, black is trying to... Um, to play on the queen side, to get more firm control over it and try to uh, defend. I see that I'm missing one move, I'm sorry, uh, because of course of the rook a8 we need to protect a2. So now we come back to knight e8, king c2, knight d6, ah yeah, f3, and now king to f8. Um, Bishop e1 just to activate it, and in this position, uh, black played rook a3, and he continued. Um, after tough five, uh, black lost the game. But what I wanted to show you um, is the way how he was playing and how it inspired me to show him the next game. So, for a brief moment, I will uh, load the game, um, and then we will just keep this in mind this game and see how we can learn from other games. Uh, so we go back in time and not even a little bit. We go back to 1916 uh, in New York, uh, one of the famous tournaments. And I'm sure that one of the listeners will be happy that this game was played in his hometown. Um, and um, what was interesting about it is that uh, Capablanca actually uh, took the idea of my pupil and in that time and he played a very um, remarkable move. So he, he played, the. we still have to keep in mind that this double B pawn should be sold because of course the pawns are not very beautiful although they are not very weak either because you can't attack them very easily and black has active play over the A pawn. So he played rook bishop d7. Bishop d7 was a remarkable move because the bishop already was active at f5 and you could wonder why we would re, uh, uh, return the bishop to a more passive uh, square. But the mo main point is that we should understand that we still need to play b5. And when we look to the previous game, we saw the strength of this b5 pawn because we want to get the knight to c4. Let's see how the game progressed. Um, interestingly enough, is what we would do with white in this position, how you would continue. And again, try to think about our previous game and keep try to get the thought of um, yeah how we can put pieces in, in the most active way and how we um, uh, yeah how we can do it. So again, you can have a small thought how white can improve this position. Okay, at the moment, uh, I hope you have some good thought and, well, there are actually maybe two or three moves. We can very actively play bishop b5 
On the other hand, we should realize that after maybe e6 with some idea with knight a5, the bishop will be trade and I can still bring the knight to c4. Was maybe not so bad, but okay, he didn't play it. He played bishop e2, which is actually rather passive, which is a little bit, uh, well, it's not bad, but uh, why to put the pieces in such a passive way? Um, best move would be, and you would get full points for bishop d3. Bishop d3 is excellent move because you can play after king to e2, rook to c1, and in this case you would have the king already in the center like in the previous game, and well, white should be a little bit better. Um, we go back to bishop e2. As, as once more, which is also important, when you look to modern games, we shouldn't pay attention to all the details. Normally you first try to get uh, the big picture, see uh, where we are playing, how we get uh, control over the center and how you can improve it in your own way. I mean, do you feel that the moves which should be played, uh, you can play them in the game? Because this is very important. Um, very often I just watch to the positions as long till I understand why this move should be played. And this is... Uh, Sometimes it's difficult because your feeling is really, I want that piece on that square and not on the other one. But in the end, we should realize that the grandmasters pay a lot of attention, a lot of work in, in making, uh, yeah, making their good moves. Uh, so in the end, we should trust that, yeah, normally they do good things. Um, e6 was played, castling. Again, the king should be better in the middle. As we can see that Capablanca already in his time played in a much better way. And in this way, I reminded my people that, um, yeah, the king belongs in the center and you can see in a nice, similar way, in an analog way, um, how this could be done. Bishop to c3, uh, rook to c8, a3, and now comes the knight to a5. Not very surprising, the knight wants to head for c4. Uh, we still probably wish to play b5 first, so we can take back with the b pawn. We have some threat of knight b3, of course, with uh, double attack on the rooks. So black is doing fine, white is defending. And now comes interesting moment because um, yeah, we have to make some choices. Before it was just we improved our position slowly. We uh, activated the king, we activated the rook. We controlled some squares and now we have to make some choices. And one of the choices, um, yeah, again, maybe I will give you a little time to think. Um, do you want to play something on the queen side? b5 might be an option. Do you wish to play for the center? Maybe f6, e5. Do you wish to prevent white's action with e4? We might play f5. Or do you want maybe to double rooks with rook c7, rook c8, just to make more tension? So we have four moves which we can consider as interesting. And one of those ideas we can make work. Okay, let's have a small look together. Um, in this position, uh, of course, we are very uh, occupying ourselves with the queen side. We are we want to play b5, we want to get rid of the b pawn, but we should always keep in mind that there's an opponent who is, of course, trying to prevent our actions. Um, and also, we have time. I mean, the, the position is rather closed, so it's important to, to do it in, in the pace which is uh, convenient. Um, and doesn't allow your opponent to counterplay. Um, that's the reason f6, e5 is red. Yeah, it's very slow because I think that white immediately will get e4 with some active play, might give a weakness on d5 or bring his knight active in the game. Um, so this is probably not the best move. Um, and that's the reason why I like this move f5, which was actually played in the game. Um, you keep control of e4, the plan with b5, knight c4 is so, still, um, still an option, doubling rooks are still options too, and well, in this way you make it for white much harder to, to get active. 
g3, b5, f3, slowly executing as planned, knight c4, and once more I could refer to the previous game where uh, the knight wanted to go to c4 and um, uh, got a nice plan. Um, in this position, um, white took on c4, b takes c4, and now came the move e4. Once more, often when your opponent is playing on the flanks, you're trying to seek a uh, counterplay in the center or the other way around. I mean, when you, um, the opponent is, of course, attacking you at the flanks, try to counterattack him in the center. And often you see, we can also reverse the rule. If you want to attack on the flanks, you should first get center control. So again, all these things are very important. What black could do? Black could play b5 again, but after e5, the bishop on d6 is a little bit, um, um, yeah, should get to a war square because the bishop wants to uh, get keep control for b4 so we can make tension in the end. Uh, and that's the reason why the king went to f7. If now e5 is coming like in the game, we can play bishop e7, eyeing on b4, playing b5, b4, and in this way we can still make a weakness on a3. Um, and the bishop is also looking to the other side, so we have a good position. Actually, it's, it's fair enough to say that why didn't play in the best way, because we see that the knight on d2 is not very good, and we should uh, find another dream square for this knight. Uh, dream square, as I said, is always in front of pawns or next to pawns, and as we can see, that next to pawns means that we would like to have a knight in e5 or g5. e5 is, of course, even better because it's protected by d4 and we, uh, we gain back the, the pair of bishops. So what white should do is um, we can take on d5, we take back and now play a nice move f4. Uh, with the idea of knight f3, knight e5, and again, um, the knight, will, yeah, white would have almost equal game. I mean, maybe black is still a little bit better, but um, not much, and it will be really much more difficult to, to win the game. Um, I don't want to show you the whole game, because after it became very technical, uh, technical which of course was very nicely done and won by uh, Capablanca. But what I want you to focus on is on to see how we can play by analog or even uh, small moves uh, can improve. So I want to go back a little bit and see what we learned. So on the one hand, what this double pawn, and which very often happens in uh, slough positions, um, is that we need the bishop on d7 to uh, first get control of the square in front of the double pawn, as I said, when you're white, you want to keep control of it, but when you're black, of course, you want to do the same, so you can make progress. Um, in the second point, what we saw is that we should develop, in, of course, with every move with a new piece, but keep in, uh, keep in mind that in the end game, the king should, uh, yeah, belongs in the, in the center, because there we can get, become more active, and it will be much easier. Um, after uh, we saw that we still are eyeing for the c4 square, but keep in mind that when your opponent is there, we still need first center control before we take action on the flanks. And when we look back, we see that there are big similarities to the game of which my people played, in fact, uh, without even knowing this game. So sometimes after the training, after you play the game, you can try to search for positions which are similar to yours or um, and or maybe even to make small improvement, maybe you played many moves, good moves like my people, but still King E7 would have been an improvement over the game. Um, as I promised you, I will go to one of the uh, games which I was playing myself, but before that I will reverse it now, I will show you first the model game which I was studying myself, and then I will show you one of the games and moves which I played uh, after it. So we go to the game of 
Karpov. Karpov was black and he was playing Wales in Baden-Baden in 1992, which is of course a very nice place to be. They have wonderful water, uh, wellness and uh, convenient place. So maybe Karpov played in the same way that um, the, the, his position. And what is interesting again is, is how he improved with every move a little bit his position. Um, so black has several ideas in this position. Of course, there are again, there's square on d4, d5 and c4, the pawns on c3 and a3 are weak, but of course white activated all his forces on the king side and is ready to crush black. Um, we have ideas with g4, might be f5, or we may maybe play h4, h5 sometime just to attack on g6. And in this way, you try to destroy the pawn structure, and in the end, of course, maybe some piece sacrifice to mate the black king. So what for black is the most important thing to do is to, um, to keep control over the attack on the king side and slowly improve uh, your way and his pieces on the queen side. Um, if we want to improve, we look to the piece which is worse, I mean, or less uh, flexible. Um, so again, I will give you a little time um, how you wish to improve your position. Do you wish to improve your bishop, your rook, uh, bishop on d7, rook on c8, maybe the rook on f8, uh, the knight on c6, for that we have squares, or maybe you think it's time for the queen to go to e7. So you have several options to improve again. Okay, let's have some thought together. Um, let's start maybe with the queen. I mean, the queen can go to e7 attacking a3, which of course in some ways is attractive. The, the main point which I learned from Karpov's games is when you make a move and your opponent, for example, takes on d7 and you have to take on d7 either, then actually you lost one move. And such moves are always a little bit of pity. I mean, when you, I mean, you want to make something uh, productive and something good. Uh, on the other hand, I'm also not sure if I really want to take an a3 yet because there's still rook a1 and taking on a7. And in that case, I exchange one of his vulnerable pawns on a3 to one of the good pawns on my side. The bishop on d7, I don't see any square beside bishop e8, and in this case, it's just rather passive uh, and not really necessary. Um, then we have two interesting moves, rook c7 and knight somewhere. And what we notice is that knight on c6 has a lot of options. We can take on e5, we can play knight a5, we can play knight e7, controlling d5 and f5. We can even maybe sometimes think about knight d4 when the bishop is away. So we can see that the knight on c6 has a lot of options and normally it's uh, very important that such kind of knights we don't want to remove. Uh, it's not time yet um, because you want to keep as much as options in the position as possible so your opponent will have a hard thought which move he should make. And Karpov played here rook c7 which I really enjoy um, and is one of the nicest move which I have seen. Um, it's a very modest move, but a very, um, yeah, very elegant move. The rook is defending on the seventh rank later on to f7 and g7. Uh, the rook is maybe protecting um, d7, c6. The bishop can use the square on c8 to get active on b7 or c6, uh, a6 in the end. Um, and maybe you might double rooks on the c-file. So we see that the rook c7 has a, uh, is a very multifunctional move. Um, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's very interesting to see that such kind of small moves can have a very deep impact, as we can see later on. So he played rook c7. Um, now, white actually wanted to continue his attack, played rook f3. Um, knight a5, because now we don't have any other move. If we want to improve our bishop on d7, we should go to c8. Um, but of course the knight is hanging, so now we should remove it. Um, still, if we play c4, 
uh, we might just take it and play bishop b5. And now we see that the d4 pawn is hanging, uh, c4 is hanging, so white simply loses material. Knight a5, g4. White was ready to cross Karpov in the most worst way, uh, which of course is in some way is maybe a good way. I mean, Karpov is one of the strongest players, especially in that time. Uh, it was, I think, one year uh, after he made his big victory in uh, Linares. Um, yeah, so he was in a good shape, and uh, so why not to play very active? Um, and now came another deep move. He played rook e8. Rook e8 is an, some kind of prophylactic move, like uh, white wants to play f5, but in this case we just might take it and take it. And again we see now the function of the rook on c7. If we want to, we, can, we are threatening f6 and now the rook, a bishop on g7 is also protected, even if white wants to play something like rook g3 or King Queen G2 just to attack uh, G7. We always have the rook already um, in defending um, way. So um, yeah, that's a very good thing. So that's uh, that's actually what I like very much about uh, Karpov, which uh, he took also a little bit of Petra Shan. Is they uh, they took out uh, opportunities in the game even before they exist. I mean. Even before White could think about attacking G7, it's already protected, so nothing can go wrong. That's a very good thing. Uh, so Rook E8 is again a small, um, nice move just to prevent actions. And now White resigned more or less on his idea, but this is this is always bad because it means that White needed time to get a quick attack. And if you start to make moves like Bishop B1, it usually means that things will get wrong. Uh, bishop c8, um, improving the bishop to b7, and also mobili you can mobilize your queen to d6. So again, it's still very multifunctional. You also have sometimes these small games where you can work out with some small blocks and uh, you, you have to figure out how to, in which way you can turn them. In this way you see it fits excellent and all the black pieces work in the puzzle. G5. Some idea to work with um, knight g4, knight of 6 but again uh, white completely resigned on this idea to attack with f5 um, and it's, it's probably very difficult to uh, mate the black king especially since we have the, the so to say uh, Sicilian dragon bishop which means that after king f8 it's very difficult to checkmate me. Black uh, continued, bishop b7, rook g3, queen d5. Nice battery. And this is actually also one of the most impro uh, impressive uh, things about Karpov. Very often he has winning or very good position even though he's not even with one single piece in, in, uh, on his opponent's part. Uh, and this is one of the things which is maybe also good to remember for your own games. Uh, very often we have the idea that if you want to win, you need to play very aggressive and very much on the opponent territory. But w as you can see here, black is not even with one piece on the opponent's uh, side, but still white has very big difficulties. Queen h1 is threatening. Maybe queen can go to b3. You have control over a lot of white squares already. Uh, opponent c3 is hanging. So you see that if you want to play active and to... Um, to attack, you don't have to play very aggressive in the way that you need to get a lot of space. Sometimes to gain some diagnosis is more than enough. King f2, maybe bishop e4 was a little better. Um, rook c8, and again we see the multifunctional way of the rook of c7. It's uh, doubling the rooks. Again, improves the black position. H4, knight c4, bishop a2. So, of course, this is some kind of uh, moment of thinking again. Um, 
white. Uh, you took control for c4, which actually is a little bit similar to the game of Capablanca, although there we wanted the knight on c4 to undouble our b pawn. Here we see that we just want to uh, keep c3 on its place just to weaken, uh, keep it weak, and um, yeah, from there on we wish to attack. Um, bishop a6, protect, bishop takes c4, bishop takes c4. Again, I will go a little bit maybe quick sometimes through the moves, but keep in mind that I'm, uh, I want to show you the analogy um, of playing and which, uh, which most important moments you should remember, because we can't remember all the moves anyway, or it's very difficult at least. Um, so what we should remember from now on that this rook c7 is very multifunctional, that you try to play the piece which has the least options, so you keep the most options in the game. This is one of the most important things to remember. Second, you try to improve your positions with every move. This is again a second point which is very important to keep in mind. And third is we want to keep the control over the squares in front of weak pawns. So again, keep those three things in mind and try to play your games according to it. Um, and especially, I will show you later how I try to apply it myself in my game, um, which I played. Uh, the queen went to e3. And this is an interesting moment. Look at the picture. None of black white pieces is on white squares. All of them are black. It's an incredible picture that you uh, that black managed. Not even with okay one piece now at the opponent's side, but black simply forces all the white pieces to the black squares, and all the white squares are his. This is also one of the interesting moments, which um, I want to give you a little time um, how to continue, because of course we feel very uh, convenient playing this position. Um, but it's uh, yeah, uh, it's not not so easy to improve because it's not easy what to attack. Um, so when we look to this, um, we can actually see it as a working day. When you have a working day, of course you 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 go to your work and when you finish your work, you you want to go home. And actually, this is a task of the bishop. In the same way, the bishop has done what he should do is taking back on c4, um, which we just go to a6. And if we go to a6, we can go to b7 again, attacking the white king, keeping the white pieces tied down to defense. And of course, we want to make more pressure on c3, which of course is one of the weakest spots in the position. So again, once more, you should always keep in mind not what you what your previous move uh, has been, but what you would like to do. And in this uh, position, the, the task of the bishop is gone, and we wish to go back and go home. Um, h5. Queen a2. Very aggressive move for Karpov. He uh, found a square on the, his opponent's part, um, pinning the piece on d2, and maybe creating the threat of rook takes c3. King goes to g1, unpinning his bishop, so the opponent c3 is protected again, and now he took an h5. I will surely go a little bit quicker, so we can go to my game which I played. Rook to h3, bishop b7, again once more, if you take an h5, I want to take on c3, because the bishop is pinned again with queen g2 mate, so in this case, white can't take on h5. Um, queen e2, threatening to take with the queen on h5, but now the queen returned, and again, tying down the white queen to defense. King goes to h2, b5. Again, small moves, and again, you see that we always try to improve, not only by pieces, but if the pieces are maximized, we try to improve with pawns and keeping in control for the c4 square. Um, probably this was also a little time trouble um, for white um, looking to the moves which are made. Queen went back to a2, rook c1, 
bishop e4 also very nice. Uh, now it's clear that the attack will never be successful because the bishop is protecting a7, even can go back to g6. So there's not much to hope for. Of course, you cannot take with the queen and e4 because bishop, queen takes d2. We win a lot of material. Rook to e3, bishop f5. So the rook cannot go back to a3. Bishop e1 and black took on a3. Marvelous game, impressive, mostly because you see that with such a tiny uh, measures, actually black was uh, giving white big problems um, on the white squares and how he slowly untangled his position and all his pieces. So now we go uh, to see um, how I tried to apply uh, the lesson Carpo wishes to make. And actually, I didn't want only to make the similar moves, because very often, of course, you can make the similar moves, but um, your opponent, of course, can easily play another move, and then we should play in the spirit of the game. So I want to show you two things. First is how I played the exact moves uh, for some time, and after, how I was trying to play in the spirit of uh, the world champion. So, in this position, um, I was uh, black. Um, um, actually, you see already a small difference. Uh, in Carpo's game, uh, white took with his b-pawn on c3, and in this position, we see the bishop on c3. So, as we notice, um, very often we are on our own uh, quite, easy, uh, quite, uh, quite soon. And in that case, you need to think what would be the way how Karpov would approach the position or how he would think. Well, we still have our first remarkable move in mind, which was rook c7. So I was thinking this looked like looks like a very good move. I protect the bishop on d7, I might even take back with my rook on d7. If he takes on c6, bishop takes to c6. Uh, maybe in the end I can play bishop c8, just to make the same maneuver later on. Um, and just give a lot of options, just slowly improving my position, maybe even protecting b7, so at no moment I can take something, or play just simply knight e7. Um, why well, play rook e1, activating as another rook, knight e7. In this position I want to take, color, take control over d5, uh, which of course uh, keeps and maintains the, the weakness on d4, um, even attacking the bishop on c3, and in such a way uh, get a very pleasant control of the whole position. Bishop to b4. Now I want you to give a little time to think again, is how we can play in the same spirit of Carpo, because of course it's clear that now we can't make the same moves. We can't play b6, bishop c8, bishop b7, uh, it's too slow, um, so we need to find another way to improve. So, what you wish to improve? We can play maybe rook e8, like in the game of Karpov. I'm pinning the knight, I can get control of d5. It's an interesting idea, absolutely. Um, we might play the bishop, but where? Bishop c8 can be its little pass. We can play bishop g7, which also was played in the game, uh, protecting your bishop, and in this way become less vulnerable. But at the moment I found a very nice move, and I hope you found this move with me, and it's the move bishop a4. Bravo! If you found this move, the move is actually uh, aiming. Uh, the bishop is actually aiming for d5. We want to play bishop b3, bishop d5, uh, controlling the square again. I don't have any problems with my uh, pawn on b7, and again I activate it to the long diagonal in a very nice way, even without weakening my pawns on b7 or a7. Um, it's with tempo. The rook on d1 is hanging, so it's a very multifunctional move again. And this is very important. This, I mean, sometimes you can uh, copy exact the same moves like rook c7, 
Uh, but sometimes we need to play in the spirit. 97 is also aiming for a weak, uh, a weak uh, strong square in front of a weak pawn. And bishop a4 is doing the same thing. Rook d2. Now I played rook e8. I was still very pleased by the idea that I could play the moves which was played by one of my favorite players, Karpov. Um, it was maybe I can take back with my rook on e7. Uh, for sure, I will prevent d5, um, and maybe, yeah, it's just very nice to be able even to play knight, is, uh, knight d5. So he took an e7, uh, now for luxury choice, uh, how to take back, and, but I still like the idea uh, of playing according to my uh, model game, and I took back with my queen, so I could double rooks on the c file and get active there. D5 is still not really a good move because there, there's hanging a piece on E5. Bishop B1. Interestingly enough, uh, my opponent is making the same moves like the opponent of Karpov. At the moment, I was sure that if he's playing moves like Bishop B1, I would have a good position because um, White only can, uh, yeah, can only have advantage in short term where he gets very active with H4, H5. Or maybe knight g4, but as soon he's making uh, passive moves or moves to uh, consolidate, um, I will get firm control over the center over square d5, and then he will have troubles in the end with pawn on d4. Um, I play bishop b3, rook went to d3, bishop d5, queen g4, rook c8. And actually, to be honest, I was even rather pleased that I could make all these similar moves. I felt very com comfortable and actually you see that I actually didn't have uh, much thought about what I should do. I can just copy them in, in most of the moves. Rook d3, rook c1. Of course, sometimes you have to think a little bit yourself still. I just wanted to exchange one pair of rooks, which means that um, yeah, his back rank will become more vulnerable and after I would try to uh, win the weaknesses on d4 or b2. Mm, bishop e4, trying to exchange uh, the bishops and now uh, yeah, I have some small tactics. Um, so I will give you a little moment. Of course, positionally, I'm very good too, so any move, or any reasonable move would give advantage to black, but there's a little bit more concrete solution. And I hope you found this move. It's the move bishop g5. I'm with tempo, I'm attacking e3, even creating a mating threat on e1, and I'm threatening f5 with double attack. So white only has one option, f4. In this position, I play bishop h4, similar idea, and I weakened my opponent with g3. Now I took on e4. Of course, white cannot take back because f5 is coming and losing the exchange. Um, so he took on h4, but of course, look at the pawn structure, it's horrible. Um, and now, even in this position, I enjoyed playing similar moves like in my modern game. I play bishop f5, queen g3, and look again. I managed to put all the white pieces on the black squares like in the previous game. It wouldn't be enjoyable to play such a position. Queen d6, again bringing the queen to the center square and now also beside the rook on c1 I don't have any pieces on my opponent's uh, side but still white has already big big troubles. Knight f3, h5, even that move I wish to copy and okay just some small moves and rook c2 and my opponent resigned not even being big material behind but there's no no way to defend the position anymore. 
So when we look back, uh, we, we, we have seen two practical games and two model games. And one, sometimes we see that we played a position and actually we fought over ourselves and found maybe some good moves. Maybe not all of the moves are good, but at least a lot of moves are good. In that way, after the game, you can uh, come home and look for Chessbase or for any other uh, database and see if you found any, um, um, yeah, any model games or any similar. How you can do it, you can just, for example, put the pawn structure and look for similar pawn structures. Sometimes you can look for maneuver and in this way you, um, yeah, you simply uh, can try to, uh, to see which move should have been played or uh, which move you played correctly. Because of course, when we look back, we also can be proud of all the good moves we are producing. In the other position, uh, I did the reverse. I watched uh, first and studied first an, a good example of Karpov and after I was trying to copy it myself. Sometimes I could make exactly the same moves and sometimes I could play in the spirit. I hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, we are at the end of our training Tuesday of uh, today. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, be so kind to, uh, to text me in um, or uh, in, in Chess24. Uh, you can always check out my website, uh, schaaktrainer.nl. Uh, unfortunately, the website is still in Dutch, uh, but I'm working on to, to make it in English. But feel free just to contact me and uh, give your questions, comments, or any, uh, any, yeah, any wishes you wish to make. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, I hope you have, you have enjoyed this show and I hope to see you next time again.